On today's video, we're going to discuss Buddhism's decline in India. What were the reasons behind it? And what are the lessons that we can take from that decline for us nowadays? Because I think there are some lessons to be learned. I'm Doug Smith from the Online Dharma Institute. That's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So this question of, of why Buddhism declined in India, it's, it's one that I think uh, concerns a lot of us. And we, I certainly read about people uh, speculating about it, talking about it in the popular uh, press and in Buddhist circles. And it's something that I think is, to an extent, not well understood. Uh, and we all, I think, well, I shouldn't say grow up with, but uh, maybe in countries in Asia people do, but here we certainly do hear about the general story that Buddhism was uh, very healthy and thriving in India uh, for the centuries after the Buddha's lifetime. Then there was this a terrible... Uh, invasion from uh, the Muslim hordes out of the, the West that uh, swept over India and destroyed Buddhism in India. That is the story that we're often given that ends up with the destruction of Nalanda, which is uh, understood to be a sort of a university kind of place. It was, at least by modern standards, a kind of university setting. This destruction of Nalanda, uh, that sort of was the capstone that ended Buddhism's existence in India. However, that story that I've just told uh, is largely fictional, or at least uh, extremely oversimplified uh, in many respects, uh, enough so that we would have to say it's fiction. Uh, so what I want to do today is to go through the real story. Even down to the present day, some of our most eminent scholars of early Buddhism, people like uh, Peter Harvey and A.K. Warder, uh, even the great Indian statesman uh, B. R. Ambedkar did write about the decline in India in the in the ways that I've just mentioned, and and so, you, what I think one has to be careful when coming at Buddhist history and reading about this particular period, even when reading it in some very good uh, other in some textbooks or books that are otherwise very good, because these mistakes keep being made. What is the reason for this? Uh, these mistakes. The reason is that the, the, this mistaken history I've given is simple. It's very simple, it's very direct, it's very easy to understand and repeat. It also is very dramatic. The, the truth, however, is more nuanced. It's something that occurs over centuries, over a long period of time, and has three basic components that I'm going to go into in this video in order. Uh, the first of these is going to be internal issues within Buddhism in India itself. Uh, in many ways, these are the most important. Uh, the second is, in, uh, is, is Buddhism's competition with Hinduism. Uh, as many of us will know, uh, Hinduism uh, arose out of Brahminic, uh, I should say Vedic Brahmanism that was around during the Buddha's own lifetime. And there was, of course, continuing competition between Buddhism and Hinduism on the Indian subcontinent uh, for, for centuries thereafter. And the third uh, component was Islam, the, 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 the uh, influence of Islam during its time period in, the, in that area. And in, in many ways, the influence of Islam is the least important of the three. However, because it comes near the end, it takes on an additional importance, which may, as we will under, become to understand, may not be as important as we think it is. And then finally, uh, in the fourth section, uh, I'll just sort of uh, go through some of the lessons that we can learn and try to put things all together. And as always with these videos, I'll put links to uh, the material that I'll be using in the show notes uh, below the video in case you want to read more. As I say, much of this, uh, much of the historical information that I get here is relatively cutting edge in the sense that it's not even included in some of the best uh, uh, sort of textbooky kinds of introductions to Buddhism. So if you want to read more, again, uh, links down below. So to begin with, uh, the, uh, the, the issues internal to Buddhism itself in the Indian subcontinent. We should remember that Buddhism arose as a kind of a mutual dependency between uh, the monastic Sangha on the one hand and the lay community on the other. 
Uh, that's the way the Buddha set it up. So that the monastic community had to depend upon the lay people for their support. The monastics were not allowed to feed themselves. They were not allowed to use money. And so if they needed things like food or clothing uh, or other things like medicine, they had to, they had to beg for it uh, from the lay community, which meant they had to go out on alms round every day in order to get the food to eat and remain fed. And this required them to remain in close contact with lay people all the time. And so during that contact, the monastics would give Dharma talks to lay people, would inform them about the Dharma, on how to live a good life, on how to live an ethical life. Uh, this kind of mutual dependency then really was the bedrock foundation of Buddhism in its beginnings. It's also important to know that, that the Buddha was not opposed to uh, people making money, to people having jobs that brought them wealth. And so Buddhism became, over its early centuries, uh, very popular among the urban merchant community in India. So it was, as things seem, largely, uh, not entirely, but largely a religion, a belief system that was maintained among the relatively up-and-coming, wealthy uh, urban community of traders who would, uh, many of them were traders along the Silk Road, uh, as we will know, between China, India, and the West. And that kind of Silk Road uh, atmosphere and uh, uh, money, wealth, then flowed into the Buddhist circles as well and helped support them. However, beginning in the, the third century of the Common Era, which is kind of around where our story begins in this video, the third century of the Common Era, we're talking about perhaps, you know, six, seven hundred years, roughly speaking, after the Buddha's lifetime. Uh, at this point, the critical trade routes in the north of India, which, uh, which connected China and the west, those trade routes in north, uh, northwest India began to dry up. The trade, uh, the trade routes seemed to have shifted somewhat uh, for various uh, reasons that don't really matter to us. Nevertheless, what that meant was that northwest India, which was a large place of Buddhist uh, learning and uh, discipleship, it's uh, around the area of Gandhara, where many of us will know that there was a, a great meeting of Greek intellectuals with uh, Buddhist intellectuals. Uh, this, uh, this area began to decline in, in its economic power. As well, in the fourth century of the Common Era, a little bit later, uh, Buddhism's impact in general in India began to decline somewhat because of the decline in urban areas. Urban areas seem to have gone through a period of of relative decline. And since, as we have just seen, or as I've just said, Buddhism at the time was particularly uh, powerful and, and influential within the urban communities, when these urban communities began to, uh, began to dissolve somewhat, Buddhism's impact began to dissolve along with it. However, more importantly, between the third and fifth centuries of the Common Era, the Sangha, the Buddhist Sangha, began to reduce their outreach to the laity. In other words, instead of having this very close contact with lay people that would have been on a daily basis, perhaps, uh, what, what began to happen at this time was that monasteries, Buddhist uh, organizations, monasteries, Sanghas, began to, to receive donations, large donations of land, and indeed of the uh, labor of entire villages through a form or forms of taxation. So that uh, local powerful people, perhaps kings, uh, would donate land to the Buddhist Sangha. And that the people who worked that land were required to then donate part of their uh, crop, part of the food that they, uh, that they gathered, to the Sangha on a regular basis. There was no longer this idea of monks going on alms round. As historian Lars Fogelin has put it, for the first time, the Sangha could afford to be isolated. That is, the Sangha, the Buddhist Sangha, the monasteries became large landowners. They didn't need to uh, uh, do outreach to the lay community. They could remain isolated within those monasteries. And indeed, by the 7th century of the Common Era, 
Nalanda University, which I mentioned before, had 200 villages assigned to it and a network of regional monasteries that were set up to uh, basically coordinate the, the, the goods coming in from those 200 villages to Nalanda University. The upshot of this was that the Dharma became increasingly scholastic, increasingly out of touch with lay concerns. Uh, one example of this is the adoption of Sanskrit within uh, Buddhist circles, which again uh, removed uh, normal uh, Dharma discourse from the ability of a layperson to understand it, because most lay people at the time could not understand Sanskrit. It was more of a literary kind of language. And the laity then, as one uh, scholar puts it, the laity then returned the favor by basically switching somewhat, or at least shading their allegiance, uh, to other kinds of belief systems. Now a lot of this period was during the what's called the period of the Gupta Empire, when the Gupta Empire broke down, there was a period after, say, the 7th century of the Common Era where there was a great deal of instability within India. And it was during this time that we have also the rise of Tantric Buddhism, uh, otherwise known as Vajrayana Buddhism. I did an earlier video on that. I'll put a link to it down below if you want to hear a, a history of that. Uh, but uh, the, basically what this form of Buddhism was was a heavily syncretic kind of uh, belief and practice. By syncretic, I mean that it, it melded ideas, uh, Buddhist ideas, with ideas from Hinduism, in particular uh, Shaivite ideas, or, or ideas around the, the uh, worship of Shiva, the deity, of Sh the deity Shiva, uh, around whom there were a number of tantric practices already in India, or at least that were arising in India, and that had been practiced in one form or another for centuries. And I'll be discussing the Tantra a little bit more later on in this video. In any event, by the mid of 8th century now, uh, basically India had split into three, three major kingdoms. Of these three, only one of these, the Pala dynasty, was Buddhist to any significant degree. The other two dynasties were basically Hindu dynasties. That is to say, they, they did not work on Buddhism's behalf. So Buddhism had basically retreated to a small area, a relatively small area, in the sort of center uh, east of India, uh, around where the Buddha would have uh, lived in, in, during his lifetime. That is to say that during this time, Buddhism was already well on its way to splitting into two major branches, which the historian Johann Elverskog terms the Buddhist Mediterranean, which is this part uh, around the uh, Bay of Bengal, where we find uh, Theravada Buddhism, basically, in the Southeast Asia and what he calls the Tantric Block, which uh, moves up into Tibet and into China and into East Asia that way. This split into two was already well on its way by the mid-8th century of the Common Era. So these are sort of some of the groundworks of the internal Buddhist issues. And we'll, we'll continue with some of that as we move forward as well. But now let's turn to our, our second part, which has to do with Buddhism's competition with Hinduism. Uh, by the time of the Muslim invasions in the late 7th century, the beginning of those, the, the, the first ones in the late 7th century of the Common Era, uh, as we have begun to see, you know, Buddhism uh, was already well on its way to being a second-class citizen within uh, India proper. Most of India was, at this point, Hindu. And this is partly due, as we've seen, to uh, switching trade routes and, and the question of, of urban versus rural kinds of communities, but it was also due to the changing dynamics between uh, Buddhist laity and Buddhist monastics, where monastics were slowly but surely retreating into their monasteries and getting more involved in more, shall we say, scholastic or recondite kinds of interests. Now, Vedic Brahmanism, which is the religious belief system into which, uh, out of which uh, Hinduism arose, was always a kind of an approach uh, based around home and hearth. It was an idea of the way that one should behave in family and as a family. It involved the sacrifices that one should make to the deities in order to have a successful family, in order to have a successful lay life, the kinds of propitious, uh, propitious kinds of, of, of uh, actions one should take towards the deities. and. These were the kinds of practices that most lay people were interested in. And so as Buddhism retreated, uh, 
Hinduism, what, what would become Hinduism, what was becoming Hinduism, had always been there. It had not gone away. And so many of the people, normal uh, lay people, would have simply turned their, uh, their practices more towards uh, those of home and hearth, those of the local deities that, that everyone was practicing around them. As one uh, scholar has put it, a scholar of, the, uh, of, this, of this period, the term Buddhist was really mostly ascribed to monastics during this period. And lay people were not called Buddhists, so to speak. Uh, it, was, it was considered that lay people might uh, perhaps donate to a Buddhist Sangha or might help one out in various ways, uh, but most practice in general uh, during India, even down to the present day, is somewhat syncretic. That is to say, most of Indian practice is not involved with a, an exclusivist kind of religious uh, uh, aim, the way we see oftentimes in, let's say, the West, where one might have to decide if one was a Christian or Jewish or uh, uh, Muslim or what have you, you're supposed to be one and not the other. Whereas in India, for many, many millennia really, there were a whole number of different religious ideals uh, going, floating around at the time, and one might practice all of them to an extent. One might, uh, as it were, uh, hedge one's bets in the way that one would also in, let's say, ancient Rome. Uh, and you, you prayed to all of the deities, or you, you made sacrifices to all of the deities, and to an extent you practiced all of the different practices. So there wasn't, we shouldn't think of, uh, of India in general as being one that was, was ever particularly separated into communities of one sort and another, now, because all people might practice all different versions of, of the different uh, uh, religions that were around at the time. But in any event, the Buddha had never been interested in fostering a lay community that was uh, ministered to by uh, Buddhist priests who would uh, officiate during certain life cycle ceremonies such as births or weddings. That was not at all the Buddha's interest. Indeed, the Buddha largely left those kinds of ceremonial uh, ideas up to the local Brahmins, uh, such as they were. And indeed that continued. Uh, whereas I say uh, Brahmanism was a religion of home and hearth, so too Hinduism wa uh, became the same kind of, or uh, simply was the same kind of practice. And so insofar as lay people would want, uh, let's say, a an officiant who would uh, help them celebrate the birth of, uh, of a child or a, a wedding, they would have to turn to the Brahmin priests. Indeed, that's ordinarily, that's always how they would have done it. And so if the, Buddha, if the Buddhist monastics were retreating away anyway, there were, there were places where people had to go, uh, that people could go and would have gone anyhow. As one scholar puts it, in the long run, this congenital weakness of not having nurtured a loyal laity made Indian Buddhism a potentially failed religion. And indeed, Hindu practitioners also adopted uh, various kinds of Buddhist symbology and Buddhist practices in order to make uh, their assimilation of people interested in Buddhism easier. Uh, for example, uh, there's an ex the example of the lingam, which is this uh, uh, object of practice, which is basically a, a male penis that was uh, prayed to and sacrificed to within Hinduism, it's still to this day. And it's been shown that over the decades and centuries, the lingam slowly began to be changed into the form of a more, more like a stupa, more like a Buddhist stupa. So it became more, it became less realistic, and more something that was easier to deal with by local Buddhists. Let's let's say, as many of us may know, the Buddha also was absorbed in Hinduism as an avatar of the god Vishnu. So. Uh, not only was uh, were Buddhist practices then uh, and Buddhist practices and Buddhist iconography adopted into Hinduism, but also the Buddha himself was adopted into Hinduism. So one could remain somebody who, let's say, was devoted was devoted to the Buddha as a as a figure as an individual, and yet be practicing Hinduism because one might say, okay, I'm I'm simply uh, uh, devoting myself to an aspect of the god Vishnu. So in this sense, Buddhists of the time uh, could remain Buddhists and be Hindus too, in the sense that they would ret retain all of their normal ritual practices. They simply would be doing it within a, a broader umbrella context of uh, the Hindu pantheon rather than an exclusively Buddhist uh, pantheon, let's say.
And then as we got into the 7th and 8th centuries, as we've seen, we have the rise of Buddhist Tantra, which came out of um, a, a general uh, milieu of Hindu Shaivite Tantras, uh, Shaivite practices, Shaivite devotional practices, and that these were absorbed into early Buddhas, or I should say Buddhism at this time, and became a very sort of syncretic blend of Hinduism and Buddhism. Indeed, the scholar Padmanabh Jaini has argued that one of the reasons that Hinduism was able to uh, absorb Buddhism into it, uh, whereas it was not so much able to absorb Jainism, which was another religion at the time, was because uh, there could be an easy kind of one-to-one -one, uh, uh, modeling of the Hindu Shaivite types of deities with uh, the early Buddhist uh, Bodhisattva deities. So once we identified, let's say, a particular Bodhisattva with a particular Hindu deity, then once again we could meld practices. We could be practicing as Buddhists within a Hindu context. As Buddhism retreated, this became seems to have become more the norm. Indeed, as the historian Johann Elverskog has argued, he says, as Buddhist Tantra evolved, it was no longer distinguishable in practice and theory from Hinduism. Indeed, the idea that Buddhism eventually dissipated within the ever amorphous category of Hinduism as a result of Tantra is one of the most common explanations for the eventual disappearance of Buddhism in India. That is to say, within India, as we have this blending of uh, Hindu and Buddhist practices, uh, the Hindu devotionalism eventually won out. Uh, the scholar James Mallinson has a, a really fat, quite fascinating paper where he uh, goes into the history of one particular uh, uh, temple, which originally was a Buddhist Vajrayana temple, and that eventually, between the 11th and 14th centuries, uh, became a Shaivite temple. He says that originally the, the, the uh, Vajrayana temple was one of the originating, uh, origins, I should say, one of the origins of Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga, we will know down to the present day, as a yogic practice. It began, it seems to have begun from within a Buddhist context, a Buddhist Vajrayana context. But in any event, in this particular uh, temple, over a period of decades and centuries, the practices slowly evolved from a Buddhist context of Vajrayana into a Hindu Shaivite context. And as Mallinson argues, this shift seems to have been peaceful. So even down to the present day, he, he recognizes that are, there are a number of prominent statues that are actually Buddhist deities, or, or Buddhist uh, bodhisattvas, let's say. But they're not, being, uh, they're not being seen as bodhisattvas, they're not being seen as Buddhist nowadays, they're seen as Hindu, they're seen as uh, particular avatars of Hindu deities. Nothing has been changed in them, they haven't been destroyed in any way, they haven't been defaced, uh, they simply continue the same practice with the same statues, even though they're being put to different use. And uh, Mallinson argues that this kind of peaceful change over decades and centuries seems to have been the norm. We have to be careful not to say that it was exclusively so. There were examples of uh, Hindu violence, there were examples of violence of various kinds, destruction of, of temples and so on uh, during this period uh, by Hindu uh, groups. So it was not always uh, peaceful. However, as, as Mallinson argues, it seems to largely have been peaceful. Now third, let's turn to the influence of Islam uh, on this whole story. And here, we'll try to, let's remember that uh, by the time of the arrival of Islam within the Indian context around the 7th century, Buddhism had largely disappeared in, in the Buddhist, in the Indian subcontinent, at least in a, lar in, in a majority of part of it. Uh, we saw that in the northwest corner, which was uh, one uh, very, very prominent place in, er in Buddhism in earlier centuries, it had largely disappeared. Buddhism had largely disappeared. And uh, by, the, uh, by the time of the arrival of Islam, uh, Islam was basically impacting into Hindu uh, parts of India. Basically, that was that was uh, what was uh, prominent in most of India, in the, certainly in the western part. Within India proper, it was really only the Pala dynasty, as we've said, that was Buddhist. Uh, 
And uh, Buddhist and Muslim forces or, or people really only met for the first time in the 8th century. And it's important to keep in mind that uh, Muslims and Buddhists lived side by side in relative peace for centuries. Uh, the, the Muslim uh, rule was typically one of a, a great deal of latitude for people of other religious beliefs living in the same groups, uh, living in the same areas as them. Oftentimes they would, let's say, put taxes upon people from other religions, but they would allow them to practice. And indeed that was the case for centuries within India. The Buddhists practiced perfectly uh, safely and happily, relatively happily, so it seems, within the, within the overall Muslim umbrella of those parts of India that had fallen under Muslim control. And indeed, in these early centuries of contact between uh, Islam and Buddhism, uh, Muslim chronicles uh, depict uh, Buddhists very favor favorably. They see Buddhism as a cosmopolitan kind of religion, just like they thought of Islam being cosmopolitan. They thought of uh, is Buddhism actually as being superior to Hinduism in that regard, where Hinduism was seen as uh, a more nationalistic kind of uh, a belief system that was less in line with their own kind of approach, which was more sort of global, more interested in the, the broader issues, and less interested in, let's say, local deities, which is, again, a huge difference between much of uh, uh, the Buddhist Dharma and at least part of the Hindu Dharma at the time. And we find historically that as Islam moved slowly east from the 8th century to the 11th century across India, again, the Buddhists, uh, Buddhist groups tended to split into these two that we've mentioned before, the, the Tantric bloc going north into Tibet and into China, and the Buddhist Mediterranean going, let's say, southeast into Southeast Asia. Uh, this, was the, the general, this had been the general uh, theme for centuries is that Buddhists were tending to, to leave to other areas as Islam encroached. However, that said, as I've tried to stress over and over again, even by the time of Islam's arrival within the Indian subcontinent, uh, Buddhism was largely absent from most of it. Uh, Buddhism was only really in one kingdom in the southeast or central east of India. Now, the end of Buddhism in India is often ascribed to the invasion that was associated with Muhammad Guri around the year 1200. It's important to keep in mind, though, that at this period, uh, Buddhism in the area in which Guri was active had basically retreated to a few, a very a handful, really, of, of large monastic institutions, which were uh, large landowners that were under royal patronage, under the royal patronage of uh, the remains of the Pala dynasty. And they were seen as such by the Muslims who were coming in. Now, as a number of scholars have pointed out, there seems to have been a, a great overstatement of uh, temple destruction. In particular, overstatement by uh, members of the British Raj during uh, the 19th century, in intending to uh, puff up their own importance and, uh, and uh, beneficence to India, they made a lot out of the potential Muslim destruction of India uh, many centuries earlier. However, looking at the data, there does not seem to have been nearly as much destruction as we're ordinarily led to believe. Indeed, the scholar Richard Eaton, who has looked into this, has found only a handful of Buddhist institutions that were desecrated or destroyed during the period of the 13th to the 18th centuries. Uh, perhaps three Buddhist institutions and uh, a number in, let's say, the high 70s of, of, of institutions total within India, which is not nothing. It, it did happen. However, it was not the uh, wanton destruction of enormous uh, numbers of temples that we're sometimes led to believe. Also is important to note, and this is something that scholars have also pointed out, that the Muslim armies did not target uh, religious institutions uh, in particular. They targeted institutions that were under royal patronage, because these were institutions that were symbols of royal power within their communities. And since it was that the Buddhist temples now were uh, prototypically within or under royal patronage, they fell under this problematic kind of designation. And we see that 
Uh, Nalanda University itself was heavily fortified and had guards at the doors. It was not a normal, uh, shall we say, uh, open temple that was simply a religious institution. It was also a symbol of royal control and power and authority and, uh, and grandeur, shall we say. And so as such, it was targeted by the Muslims, although they did not target uh, other institutions that were not under such royal patronage. However, when it came to Buddhism within India, that was really all that remained at the time that, that we have this Muslim invasion. Now, as to Nalanda's destruction in particular, the scholar Audrey Treschke has, has noted that the evidence we have about the destruction is relatively thin. It, it stems from reports that, were, that seem to have ero arisen several centuries after the fact. So we don't really know in great detail about it. However, we do know that there was still activity or in, at Nalanda uh, by Buddhists uh, well after the supposed destruction of Nalanda. Now, it would have been much smaller, and most of the people who were involved there would have left by then. However, it's not a complete destruction, and there were still people around. The problem was, however, that the institutional support was destroyed. Uh, the institutional support was all that was left for Buddhism in India by that time. As we've seen, uh, Buddhism for, for centuries had been uh, out of contact with, with basic the, the, the broader lay community. It had relied upon institutions, it had relied upon taxation and large uh, land-owning uh, areas as a, a means of support. And when that was taken out from under them by the uh, destruction of the dynasties, uh, Buddhism had nowhere to turn. And so at that point, you have a great exodus, I shouldn't say great, but an exodus of the last people remaining there into, in particular, Tibet, into the north, into the tantric block. Uh, many uh, tantric masters who were left and ascetics who were left went north into Tibet and into China. And the few who were left within India, uh, we have to surmise, would have slowly uh, been assimilated into the broader Hindu culture of the time. So what's the upshot here? The upshot is that uh, the decline of Buddhism in India cannot be ascribed to Islam alone. Islam may have been a factor, but it was arguably the least important factor in this whole long saga. Uh, what we, we do know, another thing from the upshot, is that the invasion of Islam and, and this general uh, centuries-long kind of uh, development led to uh, a, a resurgence or a, an upsurge in the importance of Tibet as a cultural center, in particular as a, as a center uh, for uh, Tantric Buddhism, for Vajrayana, as well as for aspects of Mahayana. It became a, a new sort of a Buddhist holy land and remains to an extent that way to this day. As well, we have the other part of the, this Buddhist split into Southeast Asia remaining with, with that group we call the Theravada nowadays who were uh, more interested in earlier teachings. So on being exiled from India, in a sense, Buddhism went from being a local belief system, a local kind of philosophy and practice within India, to a global and world belief system by moving into China, Southeast Asia, Tibet, Japan, uh, Korea, and then around the world. In much the same way that we see a similar kind of occurrence after China's invasion of Tibet and the exile of the Dalai Lama uh, in the 20th century. That as well led to a kind of a, a rebirth of Buddhism uh, in Tibetan, along Tibetan lines around the world as uh, Tibetan teachers uh, went to different countries to, to uh, promote their inter interpretation of the Dharma. The Dharma is a paradigmatically cosmopolitan kind of belief system, as we've already mentioned when uh, Islam met with Buddhism, there was, uh, they saw a lot of commonality in their uh, broader interest in the broader world and uh, their rejection of things like the caste system, which both Islam and Buddhism agreed upon. And uh, that kind of cosmopolitanism is one of the things that has led to uh, the, the popularity of Buddhism to this day. However, that popularity, and this is one of, I think, the main lessons we can take, that popularity depends essentially upon a close contact between uh, the teachers, the uh, monastics, the, the knowledgeable people in the Dharma, and the broader lay community. That when and if that link is broken, 
uh, the strength of Buddhism as a practice begins to wane. The health of Buddhism down to the present day requires an avoidance of, let's say, scholasticism, an avoidance of our perhaps natural wish to retreat to the monastery and simply discuss the Dharma among friends, but rather to, to bring the Dharma out to the broader lay community, to the broader world. And indeed, we can see that down to the present day with the development of new forms of Buddhism, uh, forms of Buddhism that, that uh, you may hear on the news, or, such as mindfulness practice, or MBSR, or uh, uh, insight practices, or various forms of Tibetan practice, or Zen, or indeed uh, secular Buddhist practice as well. Now, some of these practices are, are, are denigrated by, by various scholars who perhaps uh, should know better because there are all kinds of developments within uh, any kind of belief system over the years. Uh, it's, I think, to, in my way of thinking, the development of, of new forms of Buddhism is, is extremely important. So long as these new forms really touch on lay concerns, touch on concerns in the broader community. And indeed, it's exactly these kinds of developments in the broader community that brought Buddhism back to India in the person, uh, more than anybody, the person of uh, Dr. B. R. M. Bedkar, whose uh, new Buddhism, whose, ref we might say, uh, revolution in Buddhism, his, his retelling of the Buddhist story within a contemporary context has resonated with so many within India uh, down to the present day. And I did an earlier video on Dr. Ambedkar, which you might want to take a look at if you want to see how Buddhism has come back to life. Thanks so much. If you're getting anything out of these videos, check out my Patreon page. Uh, you might want to join all the patrons on Patreon who make this possible. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next one.